I can't remember how I first found out about uh, Lady Weavenstar. I mean, her her very existence, the the films that she made. Though uh, I know the first reference, which I didn't understand at the time, uh, because uh, my parents used to talk about so that when when they were engaged and when they were first married, they were absolutely constant theatre goers and also cinema goers. Uh, apparently, I heard more about the theatre, about the things that they saw, uh, and so on. But uh, also about films, and one of the films that they remembered seeing would be about nineteen thirty-one, I suppose, very early sound films, or maybe even the last of the silent films, because the, the what what they had seen and always remembered was The Blue Light, the first film that uh, Lainey not only starred in, but directed herself, and so on, and, um, they, 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 which is originally a silent film, but uh, there is a sound version, which uh, I have both of them in the uh, thing, which was sonorized in about 32 and uh, so on but uh, they they always remember my mother in particular talked about that so before I knew about Lady Weefensal before I knew much about films at all except as a constant film goer from the age of five uh, I uh, I knew about a Lady Weefensal film but uh I don't know when I would have first seen... I think I must... That's right. Uh, When I was running the film uh, society in Cambridge, I I found out that the Lady Riefenstahl Olympic Games film was available, and so I programmed it, and that was the first of her films that I saw myself. And, uh, of course, it's wonderful. And, uh, though my old friend, Lottie Eisner, who was um, a famous German critic who lived, or was living when I, when I knew her, which, when she was in her 80s, in, in Paris, writing in French. Uh, but uh, she, I, I think Lottie must have been at some stage, uh, Fritz Lang's mistress. She was certainly very close to Lang in early days. Wrote one of the authoritative books about Lang. Also an authoritative book about Murnau. And the first book of hers that I read, one of the first books that I got and read in French, Le Grand Demoniac, uh, which is about the expressionist cinema in, in Germany. And so, well... Lottie, like most, I guess, liberal Germans who had exiled themselves to stay out of the way of the Nazis and so on, she um, she detested uh, Laney and the, uh, the whole idea of Laney. And she always said, well, uh, her editorial assistant, uh, Walter Rutman, who, the man who made... Uh, a uh, very famous silent film, Berlin, The Song of a Great City, uh, was a, primarily a documentarist. Uh, he said, oh, well, it was all Rutman who did it. I mean, that woman, she wouldn't have known how to do anything, which was obviously untrue. Uh, and in any case, curiously, later on I got a book about Rutman, uh, which I found in a bookshop in Turin, of all places, in, in, in Italian. It's uh, to do, put out by one of the Italian institutes, I guess, and found that Whitman, uh, more than, more than uh, Laney, really, uh, was a star of Nazi cinema and made endless uh, documentaries in praise of the Nazis and their works and so on. So... But anyway, that was a, uh, clearly there was that sort of prejudice ag- uh, against Lainey. Uh, and uh, she was, I think, 
denazified because they, they all denazified after the war I believe those that could be denazified and, uh, and she finally got hold of the stuff because during the war she was mostly in Spain uh, making uh, her feature film uh, also star uh, starring herself and uh, she um, hadn't f finished, or she hadn't edited it, at least, uh, by the end of the war. And so, after the war, she had to wait until she'd been denazified and so on, before she finally got all the stock back and was able to complete edit it and uh, put it out. Uh, so, uh, the, the, and there was obviously this sort of general prejudice because she was regarded primarily uh, as a Nazi. I mean, she'd been a Hitler favourite and, and a great friend, to say the least, of, of Hitler. I think I told you the story that Strasser puts out about her once being summoned to Hitler's bedroom. And uh, they, the people around her said, if he ever asks you, you have to tell us what happened. And in the morning, she... Well, all she would say was that Hitler had revealed himself to be an onanist. Uh, and she was supposedly shocked and horrified by that, but knowing Laney as I got to later, I, I wasn't sure how horrified she would be. She struck me as being pretty sophisticated in that respect. Still, who knows what she was like in 1935 or whenever that happened. Um, and uh, so, um, having seen Olympia, I, uh, I thought, oh, you know, I must know about her, more about this. I must see more of her films, and of course, the triumph of the will was notorious, but largely unseen. Uh, and so, but uh, finally, I, 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 I got a chance to see it. I think it must have been shown in some special season at the National Film Theatre, and so on. And, and that is is wonderful too. Uh, uh, I mean, the way it's put together, the way it's shot, is just amazing. And uh, so, when I finally got got to see her, one of the thing first meeting, I asked her, expecting she would be totally outraged. Uh, and so and I said, I said that well, uh, a lot of the way that the mass movements in this Nazi rally are photographed and sort of reminded me of big Busby Berkeley uh, sequences in the, the, the early 30s musicals uh, uh, and so on. And she said, oh yes, it was great influence. I, I, I love uh, Busby Berkeley films. I, I mean, I thought it was a serious filmmaker. She would be outraged this. Though she did start as a dancer. She was first of all trained as a dancer, uh, had some success as uh, well, a solo dancer, I suppose. There were quite a number around at that time, more or less comic, grotesque, or serious, and so on. So he was just one of them, but she was very successful. And from that, she was... Uh, taken up by uh, by Fang, who made these, what they called Heimat films, which were mostly about skiing and mountaineering, and the, the, the thread of plot, you know, the, the, they were fiction films rather than documentaries, but only just. And uh, Laney had a, was taken up by him and starred skiing and acting <laughs> Uh, a bit, I suppose, uh, in several of his films. That was how she started in in cinema. And uh, then she made uh, The Blue Light, which was a sort of Heimat film, only with mystical overtones, because it's about uh, this uh, village maiden who has access to a, a sort of blue grotto high in the mountains, and um, uh, that's why I call the blue light. And uh, um, she, I think she comes to, a, I can't remember how it ends, but I think she comes to some kind of sticky end because 
the uh, the villagers want to exploit this, and she and, and she dies falling, trying to prevent them from spoiling her magic grotto. Uh, so um, I uh, then I again I I must have been quite persuasive with Penelope Houston because, like with the Powell article, I persuaded her to to let me interview Laney because I wanted an excuse. I never liked to go and see my idols uh, if I don't have anything to offer them. But, you know, being able to say, well, I need to interview you for The Times or Sight and Sound was a, a great come on. I mean, there were many people who didn't want to be interviewed in that sort of context. So, uh, and at that time, this would have been, I suppose, in the late 60s, I was writing a regular article, a column, in Sight and the Sound, under the pseudonym of Arkadin, after the uh, Orson Welles film, uh, which I could put in anything that, uh, that I liked. It would be, you know, you'd have five or six or fewer uh, small sections in, in, in the thing. It was a, like, like a sort of quarterly column. And uh, so I was able to, uh, to put Lady in that. And so I went to see her and I saw her in her apartment in Munich. And uh, immediately we got on like a house on fire. Uh, I mean, she, obviously I, I loved her films. I appreciated and, uh, and uh, asked her all the right questions. And I mean, I think the Busby Berkeley thing was one of the right questions that no one had ever thought to ask her, or perhaps never dared to ask her before. And so on, so, um, and uh, the interview appeared, and that was that. Uh, but uh, I, at that time, for some reason, I, I was in Munich fairly frequently, and uh, so whenever I was in Munich, I'd see her and we'd meet. And then, a bit later on, still towards the end of the 60s, I suppose, uh, she came to London, stayed in London for, I think, about six months, uh, because she was trying to set up, there was some sort of putative deal that she would make a remake of The Blue Light in English as a British film, uh, which... Uh, uh, since most of the distributors, certainly the sort of people who would distribute such a film, uh, were Jewish men in the British film industry, and so on, they were all dead against it, and so uh, the film never came to anything. She just, but she, uh, she stuck around for about six months <coughs> with various, more or less, abortive negotiations. And uh, during that time, uh, my friend John Cabal, the film archivist of uh, for film photographs, particularly film-related photographs, and I, at that time, we belonged to a sort of in very, very informal dining club called the Love Grove Group, and uh, so. Uh, the idea of which is that each Monday, we were originally six of us, uh, would set up a dinner somewhere. We'd, uh, we took it in turns to choose the restaurant, and you could take along as many guests as you liked. So, um, uh, and all you had to do was, on the Monday, you would phone, if I was doing the choosing of the restaurant, you would phone me and say how I would tell you where it was going to be, you would tell me how many, if any, guests you were going to take along. So uh, on this occasion, John and I took uh, Lainey along and uh, had a great dinner and so on. But what, what, what it treated me was that one member of this uh, dining group 
uh, was an illustrator called Ma uh, Marion, who had um, she uh, was quite a successful children's book illustrator, but also did a lot of work with Jim Henson on uh, on his puppet films, uh, designing the puppets and so on. But she didn't really know anything much about cinema in a serious or, or scholarly way and so on. So afterwards she said, now, who is that lady uh, that you, you brought along? Uh, she seemed fascinating and so on. So we, told, and, uh, we said, well, how old would you think she was? At this time, Lady would have been in her early 70s, I think. And uh, she said, this has to be a trick question. Now, she has been, and essentially still is, a beauty, but she, ha she hasn't looked after herself. She's uh, obviously tanned. She's spent a lot of time in the open air and so on. She hasn't led a sort of boudoir life and, and so on. So she's probably looks a bit older than she actually is. So I would say um, 43. And we said, would you believe 73? <laughs> and, uh, but and, uh, it's true that if you didn't know anything about Lady at that time, you would have thought so. Because um, I mean, she she was, was was still svelte and young and and, and beautiful, but but tanned, obviously an open air lady rather than than a professional beauty, and uh, so on. But uh, that somebody who was obviously as a successful illustrator and artist generally very visually aware that she should think that the lady was. Thirty years younger than she actually was, was uh, struck me as rather remarkable. And for years, I would uh, get Christmas cards from Rainey, usually pictures of herself, you know, ju just emerging from the water after one of her uh, swimming exhibitions. She uh, she was also a great swimmer, diver, or had been, and uh, she, she continued. Her last film, in fact, which was, I think, the first film to be made and released by someone over a hundred, uh, was uh, about, uh, based on her diving and filming fish and so on, under, under the Red Sea, yeah. and so on. So, she, uh, so the, there were plenty of pictures of, of her in swimming costume, looking looking as good as ever, emerging from the water or whatever. Nice, and, nice it, and, and indeed, when she was 99, I think, because uh, later on, instead of, uh, instead of making films, because she was, tended to be rather frustrated in that, like uh, with the whole British Blue Light incident, yeah. uh, they, uh, she, uh, she became a a stills photographer instead, and made these famous best-selling books and pictures of the Nuba oh, yeah. and uh, uh, other African tribes became obsessed. And uh, I, I must say, I I really liked her. Perhaps I oughtn't to, but uh, and, and, and I, I, you see, I think I mean people say, well, she must have known about Nazi atrocities. She must have. Known. So, and I think, well, people do overestimate the amount that ordinary Germans knew about concentration camps and so on. They they, they weren't that, that much publicised. I mean, well, people in the West didn't know until after uh, the end of the war when uh, when troops entered Belsen, Buchenwald, yeah. and so on. Uh, so uh, it is not a, not so difficult that uh, the Germans wouldn't have known, and I think even those close to Hitler, which Lady certainly was, um, though she was out of Germany, uh, shooting this film in Spain, Spain yeah. for a lot of the war, the later stages. 
so um, she wasn't close to the uh, well, the worst excesses of the final solution. Uh, so she wouldn't necessarily have known about it, but still. Uh, the, uh, the point is that I think it was quite possible for a lot of uh, Germans, even if they did sort of know about it, to keep it out of their minds. It, like the, uh, like I, I always think of the <coughs> the thing in um, I forget which Flaubert novel it is, but there's a situation where there's the old husband with a young lover, a young wife, and a young business partner, and he sees the wife and the business partner together, and at one point he says, if once the word love is born between them, then I am lost. And I think that's a situation which exists in all sorts of situations. As soon as you put a name to it, as it were, then it assumes a sort of reality which um, uh, makes things totally different. As long as it doesn't have a name, as long as it's something vague and undefined and on the fringes of your consciousness, then you can manage to ignore it, dismiss it. So to, to look at the film Triumph of the World as propaganda would be a mistake? because she didn't make it as, as propaganda, she made it as an artistic film. Uh, yes, I, I, I think that is absolutely the case. And, uh, and I mean, uh, she, she had a lot to do, not only with filming what happened, but arranging what happened, uh, uh, arranging the choreography, as yeah, it were. The, the position uh, of the cameras. Well. Yes, the position of the cameras, obviously. But also, I think, the choreography of what they, the, the massed forces did, marching round and forming groups in the, in the stadium and so on. I think she sort of staged it as well. Like and Olympia, that, she staged a lot of that, that the camera was able to focus very closely on the faces. Well, well that's right. Sports, and also, uh, the, the I mean, uh, bits of Olympia uh, really approach abstraction. I mean, I think in particular of the great sequence of the divers, the divers where, yeah. uh, you know, they, it's repeated rhythmically, uh, worked out. And, and so, towards the end of the thing, you don't even see the divers hitting the water. It's entirely patterns of them uh, the, diving the and going around the yes. body uh, in the air, the, the, doing turns and all the rest of it that yeah. they, the fancy divers do on their way down. And so on. So I, th I think you know that her her films really are are pretty abstract. In fact, I I don't see uh, any of them as being unashamedly propaganda. Mm -hmm. But obviously they they would be used for propaganda. But she that's another matter. She wasn't she, aware that that would be the usage of them. Well, I think she well, was. She probably again. I think it's if once the word love is well, but as long as uh, she was making the film that she wanted to make. She she often had quarrels with Goebbels because she didn't do what he wanted. She did what she wanted. And it, it was all an artistic thing as far as she was concerned. And, well, she must have been aware that they were, these were going to be used I mean, even, even, the, even the Olympia film is, is, is propaganda because it uh, is all sort of boosting the prestige of Nazi Germany and so on. But um, so yeah, I mean, I think in all these situations you have two parts which of course are intimately related, but in a rather strange way you have the art involved in painting the painting, making the movie, and the attitudes of the person doing it, the artist in charge. And then you have the possible uses that it can be put to. Subsequently. Uh, subsequently, exactly. And I, 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 I just think that a lot of 
lady's career who has followed the same sort of course that uh, yes she must have been aware that anything she made with uh, official approval was going to be used for official purposes which would be pro-Nazi propaganda and uh, so she uh, managed to I mean, uh, I think, you know, artists tend to be self-absorbed, dare I say that to you. But, uh, and, uh, you may. and I think that uh, she knew what she wanted to do. She, I think she was an artist through and through. I think she certainly the, the greatest woman filmmaker ever, even today. And uh, there was nothing that she couldn't do in films. And... Uh, and I think she was so obsessed with what she wanted to do that, you know, perhaps quite cynically, she took the opportunities offered, thinking, well, I mean, it's like, like people in, in the Hollywood in the 70s making porno movies because that was a way that they could make the movie that they wanted to make. And if you had a, enough uh, strong sex scenes in it, to sell it to that audience, then then you could get the money to make it. Uh, and I think probably the films made for or under totalitarian regimes uh, are often made in the same way. They think, well, they're going to use it for propaganda. Okay, let them at least. I have the studio facilities. I have the budget. I can do what I want. She certainly uh, alludes to that in. in in an interview I've watched. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And that's the impression you get from her, her autobiography too. That the, I mean, I think in the autobiography she plays a bit more innocent than she actually was. But I think that's the basic thing. She was a self-employed, self-serving, self-concentrated on herself in a, in a way that a lot of artists do. She was obsessed with the need to make films, to make wonderful films, and she would put up with almost anything in order to in order get to the make, ability yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. She she's says something like that in this interview. Mm. Yeah. When was the last time you saw her? Uh, a little while before her, her death, as I say, um, up nearly to her death. I uh, would get the regular Christmas cards and so on. But I think probably the last time I saw her would have been... Uh, around 1990, maybe. But I'm not sure when she actually died, but it would be a few years before she died. Mm. So perhaps, it, perhaps earlier than that. Was this at one of your Monday suppers? <laughs> yes. Okay. No, no, the, the last time wouldn't. I mean, no, it must have been probably, possibly the last time I was at Munich. Mm -hmm. I haven't been in Munich for some time. And I, when I went as usual to see her. Mm -hmm. And of course there were a couple of uh, movies about her, which I have on DVD, needless to say, uh, made subsequently to that where she's interviewed at great length by this sympathetic guy and uh, you know XX and uh, you see how she's living at the time and that, that was made when, uh, when she was about 97 or 98 I think and the English version of the English distributed version is called the wonderful, terrible life of Lainey Riefenstahl. So, uh, and do you think that sums it up? I think it sums it up quite well. Yes, I think it sums her up. But she's, well, like all great artists, she's much too complex to be captured in one way. And I think she is a great artist. I mean, I think it's notable that even Paul Rother a great sort of left-wing 
a critic and a historian of films in Britain admits in, in his main book about films that, uh, that, that, that she was absolutely brilliant, that she was... Uh, I mean, he sort of did sort of evil... Well, it's like... Well, like I always find myself saying about Hitler, when people say, oh, he, he was nothing, he was just a little man, I say, no, he, he was a great man. He may have been a great evil man. I'm not saying he wasn't, but you can't deny that he was a great man. With charisma. With charisma, oh, with yes, Lord knows. Uh, all the accounts I've heard from people who knew him or encountered him, uh, you know, stress the incredible charisma he had. 